<clears throat> this is Sally Anero from Taylor Wessing, and welcome to our webinar. Today's webinar is part of our webinar program where we bring you our expertise and views on topical data protection issues. Our regular attendees will be very familiar with our previous topics, which will include things such as managing cybersecurity risks, mobile apps and privacy, data transfers, and use of CCTV, and including, of course, the progress of the EU data protection regulation, among many other subjects. Recordings of these webinars are still available if you've missed them and still wish to engage on these topics. Today, we're going to be revisiting the fundamentals of the current data protection law. For those of you who are new to Taylor Wessing or new to our webinar program, welcome. As you'll see from the slide, Taylor Wessing is a leading international law firm. We act for a range of leading clients in local and international markets, providing a full-service law firm offering from our office footprint, and this spans across Northern, Central, and Eastern Europe, as well as the Middle East and Asia. We've listed some more details about the firm on the slide deck for your reference. Today's webinar is brought to you by Taylor Wessing's International Data Protection Practice. Our team advises on all aspects of data protection and information law from our office footprint. We are a global 22 partner-driven team and we're also complemented by our international network of data privacy law specialists. At Taylor Wessing, we have a dedicated microsite specifically for all things data protection, our global data hub. From this site, you'll be able to access news, weekly updates, and bi-monthly mail shots if you register. We also do topical issues where we look at regular issues that are raising concerns or challenges in the data protection arena. And you'll find details of our forthcoming webinars along with recordings of our archived webinars. As I said, my name is Sally Anero and I am a member of the London Data Protection Practice and I'm joined today by my colleague Lucy Lyons. And our profile information is on these slides for, for your information. So, in today's webinar, we're revisiting the basics of the current data protection law. Now, you may be asking yourself why we would focus today on a law that's likely to be replaced in the next two and a half years. Shouldn't we, in fact, be focusing on the progress of the EU data protection regulation reform? Well, the answer to this question lies in how we prepare for this eventual change to the law. And this was reiterated by the UK regulator's Deputy Commissioner and Director of Data Protection, David Smith, in his blog of uh, September 7th, and that was on preparing for the EU data protection reforms. He emphasized in that blog the importance of making sure, and this is to quote his words, you're right on the ball in meeting your current responsibilities. Now, this is understandable because many aspects of the new law will be an evolution of our current law. So by understanding and checking our compliance with the current law, we're helping to build a compliance baseline from which we're going to be better able to meet the changes in the law when these are finalized. So, today we're going to look at the key concepts of the current data protection laws in the UK, where we visit the core principles at the heart of the Data Protection Act, as well as look at what the secondary legislation around data protection says that's relevant to privacy and electronic communications, as well as touching briefly on the use of uh, tracking tools, such as, uh, such as cookies. So, without further ado, uh, I'll start off by passing the ball over to my colleague, Lucy. Hi there. As Sally mentioned, it's been reiterated by the Information Commissioner Office that it's very important now with the upcoming regulation to comply with the current legislation. So we thought we'd run through what that legislation actually is. As most of you will probably be aware, the EU um, Data Protection Directive of 1995 aim to establish common standards across the European Union for data protection legislation. Each member state, however, did adapt this differently, which led to a slight patchwork of implementation legislation. In the UK, this was implemented by way of the Data Protection Act 1998, which grants rights to individuals in respect of their own personal data and imposes obligations on those who are in control and process that data. The Act replaced the previous Act of 1984 and came into force on 1st of March 2000. Of course, this isn't the only uh, legislative act that we have in the UK regulating privacy. 
We've also got the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations 2003, as amended by the regulations in 2011. These regulate things like unsolicited marketing messages, advertising messages um, sent by phone, fax, email, and text messages, and things like cookies and location data, giving rise to the cookie banners that you will have seen displayed more and more recently. So in thinking about this framework, what information do these laws actually go to protect? And the purpose of these legislative instruments is to protect the processing of personal data. Processing covers quite a wide range of activity, including collecting, holding, viewing, disclosing, or erasing data. And it's important to remember that it can cover both electronic and manual processing. In terms of definition of personal data, generally defined as, a living in, as data relating to a living individual who can be defined either directly from that data or indirectly by reference to other information. It does not have to be strictly confidential information, which is important to, make, to note. And it's also important to remember that it can be a combination of different bits of information that are linked together. For example, you can have a phone number that can be linked to a name on a database, and this could be personal data. Most of you will be aware there are also special protections for sensitive personal data. There's a list of what sensitive personal data is defined of on the slide in front, in front of you. And for such data to be processed, ex extra conditions need to be satisfied. Um, I'll just run through some of these quickly. So a data subject should provide explicit consent if one of these categories of sensitive personal data is to be processed. And the Information Commissioner's Office is clear that this should cover, where possible, the detail of the type and purpose of processing this information and including any special aspects of the processing, for example, if any disclosures are to be made. Another condition that could be satisfied is where it's necessary for the data controller's obligations under employment law, where processing the sensitive personal data is in the vital interests of the data subjects, for some non-profit organizations, where the data subject has made such information available publicly and deliberately, for legal proceedings, legal advice, and some administrations of justice, and in some circumstances for health necessary for medical processing and where reviewing equal opportunities data with regard to racial and ethnic origin. So if we look at the main actors involved in current data protection law, we have data subjects to whom the data is about. Um, this will include individuals on marketing lists, employees, customers, it doesn't include lim limited liabilities companies, but will include individual directors, officers, employees, so the, where the personal data relates to them, which is important to remember. The data controllers, those people responsible for and making decisions about the data, even if the processing is outsourced to a third party or held by a third party. And it is possible to have more than one data controller as a data controller in respect of personal data, and data controllers must comply with all obligations under the DPA. And thirdly, you have the category of data processors, where those entities process data on behalf of the controller. And we've set out an example for you below. So what do data controllers have to comply with? Data controllers must make sure they, that they comply with all aspects of the DPA. DPA, and that includes that they must carefully select and supervise the data processes that they appoint. Importantly, data controllers must notify with the commissioner, and it's a criminal offence to fail to register where required. The notification with the information commissioner is quite general in the UK and includes a general description of the personal data you're processing, the purposes you're processing it for a description of recipients, 
if you're transferring outside the EA and some general security provisions. It should be renewed every year, and there was a recent enforcement action, which I'll mention in, in a minute, about a non-notification. Um, the a data controller must, of course, comply with eight data protection principles, which Sally will run through shortly. This slide lists out the rights for data subjects under current data protection law. It is an area that has seen an increased amount of attention in the press, and we've seen it used in pre-action disclosure increasingly of late. Sally will mention more on the rights of data subjects under the principles, but there are some of the main rights outlined here. Obviously, the one that has gained most attention is the right to access and obtain a copy of personal data for, for data subjects of their personal data recorded about them. Um, and more, more recently, certain cases where data subjects can ask to get their data corrected or erased. Um, now to come on to why we should be, data controllers should be concerned about um, complying with the DPA. Obviously there's a risk of being prosecuted by the ICO um, who can also issue, issue enfor enforcement notices, fines, audits, and there is a significant cost in responding to complaints, especially when they're in higher volumes, the risk of being sued, and of course the damage to commercial reputation once a company is in the spotlight for breach. To give some recent examples of ICO um, action, there was last month, just in August 2015, uh, the ICO prosecuted a company for non-notification, so breach of section 17. Earlier this month, there was a fine of 75,000 for a company um, for unsolicited marketing calls to sell cold call blocking devices. Um, there was, in March of this year, the ICO issued an enforcement notice to stop sending nuisance text messages to a company that was estimated to have sent 4.5 million texts in an eight-month period. And most recently, there was a fine of 180,000 for loss of computer equipment containing customer details. So you can see that the ICO is taking action and in a broader array of areas. Thanks, Lucy. The data protection principles are at the heart of the UK data protection law. They consist of a, a number of common sense standards that data controllers must comply with when processing personal data. So let's start with the first principle, which talks about the need to process personal data fairly and lawfully. If you look at lawful processing first, the minimum standard here is that all processing of personal data will be unlawful unless it meets one of a number of conditions that are set out in Schedule 2 of the Data Protection Act. In the case where sensitive personal data that Lucy described is involved, then one of a further set of conditions found at Schedule 3 of the Data Protection Act must apply in order to, for those conditions, uh, and that's in addition, sorry, to those conditions that are found at Schedule 2. Each of the purposes for which any personal data are processed must be considered in order to establish that there is a relevant legitimizing condition for that processing. So for example, let's say that customer data is being collected when a person is purchasing a widget from a company website in order to process the payment and deliver the product. In such a case, the legitimizing criteria is likely to be that the processing is necessary for fulfilling the contractual terms for the supply of the product. But let's say the product is a disability aid and certain measurements are needed from the customer to make sure the product fits them correctly. In that case, the business is likely by implication to also be collecting sensitive personal data about the health of the customer, meaning that a Schedule 3 condition would also need to be considered. For example, whether the subject has given his explicit consent to the processing of that data or possibly where the processing is for medical purposes, but, but that condition would only be relevant where the processing was being undertaken by a medical professional or a person that was 
subject to an equivalent duty of confidentiality to a, to a health professional. So in addition to the core legitimizing conditions, personal data could also be unlawful where it, it breached uh, another provision of the data protection law, or also potentially where it contravened another law, or perhaps indeed a, a common law duty such as confidence. Although the Data Protection Act itself is quiet on, on that, that point. Importantly, the first principle also requires that the processing of personal data is fair. Now, in practice, being transparent with people is one of the core mechanisms for establishing fairness. This means being open and clear with people about who they're giving their personal information to, uh, meaning you know, who is the, the legal data controller for, for their information, explaining how this information will be used, and giving other information that may be needed to make the processing of the data fair, such as explaining who the data may be shared with or uh, what rights the individual has in relation to accessing or correcting their data. Only by being upfront with individuals will they then be able to make informed choices. This will be particularly important where consent is the lawfulness condition that's being relied upon uh, to legitimize the processing. The Data Protection Act doesn't define what is meant by consent, but the European Directive on which the, the UK law is based states that consent should be any freely given, specific, and informed indication of the wishes of the data subject. Like the first principle, under principle the second principle, the focus is, again, on, on transparency and notice about why data is being processed, or that's implied in the second principle. The schedules to the Act talk about specifying the purposes for which personal data are processed, um, and specifying the purposes can only be achieved effectively by way of a notice. Uh, firstly, the, in the... Um, Explanatory uh, information in the Act, it talks about giving a notice to the Commissioner, which is where the notification obligations that Lucy mentioned to the ICO uh, will, will satisfy that, that criteria. But secondly, in a notice to the subject, uh, which complies with the first principle, um, uh, the second aspect of this principle is to not then process the data in a way that's inconsistent with that purpose that you've specified. In other words, if we were to revisit that example of the widget company selling disability aids, if no specific data protection notice was given to the customers outside the sale and delivery of the product, uh, but the company then subsequently decided after collection it would like to use the collected customer data to market other of its group company products and services, and to do that without returning to the customer and getting their consent for that different use for their details would breach this second principle. Looking at the third principle, this says that personal data should be adequate, relevant, and not excessive in relation to the purpose or purposes for which they are processed. In practice, this requires data controllers to collect uh, from data subjects only the information that they need for their specific purpose or purposes um, uh, for processing that data, but not any more than that. So, in effect, data controllers should apply a, a kind of a Goldilocks approach to their data, so ensuring that you know, it's just right for their purposes and not collecting any data that's sort of just in case or on a rainy day basis. So, for example, a business may need to collect certain mandatory information to deliver its product or to verify the identity of the client, perhaps where a credit check is required. But to collect more data about customers, uh, on this same mandatory basis that goes beyond what's actually required to deliver that product or to make that verification would breach this principle. Now, that's not to say that a business is prevented from asking for additional data from a, per a data subject, because, in fact, they might like to understand the customer, customer better and, and help to ensure their services are more relevant. But the individual should understand what information is needed for what purpose and be free to choose to withhold the nice-to-have information if they choose. The fourth principle, in effect, appears the most straightforward. Elsewhere in the Act, it's explained that personal data will be inaccurate if they are incorrect or misleading as to any matter of fact. So a mere statement of opinion that's recorded about someone is unlikely to be capable of being challenged on the grounds of factual inaccuracy. But that's not to say that under the third principle, for example, that an opinion may be excessive data for the wider purpose of the processing. The obligation to comply with the fourth principle rests with the data controller, but the Act allows, if we take the example of our widget company, for example, it would allow the widget business uh, 
um, not to breach this principle if its customer or third party uh, provided it with inaccurate personal data, but which it records as provided, uh, where it had taken reasonable steps to ensure the accuracy of the data. Whether the data should be updated may depend on the circumstances. So the type of data involved, they need to be considered and why it's being processed. So for example, data on our customers' payment details uh, will need to be kept up to date, whereas other records uh, may record a moment in time and need to stay as they are in order to explain decisions or, or actions that have been taken at that point. The fifth principle deals with the need to dispose of personal data that are no longer relevant for their purpose. The Act does not set out in tablets of stone the time period through which different types of records must be collect, must be held. Sorry, Rather, data controllers need to consider all of the personal data they process and the reasons why they process that data. And then for each type of data, they need to decide how long they need to keep the data to fulfill that purpose. Now, typically, this is going to mean setting out the different types of data and the relevant retention time frame for that data in the body of a data retention schedule that explains how long certain records need to be retained and that points to the reason for that retention period. Now, in some cases, that reason may be an obligation arising under a different law, such as perhaps under employment law or uh, under health and safety uh, law or obligations. It may also be driven by a limitation time frame relevant to litigation. It's worth noting that the, at the point data is destroyed, this will also be an act of processing of personal data. And the seventh principle that talks about the security of processing, and which I'll come on to, uh, is going to be relevant here as well. The sixth principle deals with the rights of individuals under the Act. Now, Lucy has already mentioned uh, in summary what some of these, these rights. Uh, and needless to say, if a data controller fails to honour any of these rights in practice, uh, then he will breach this principle. Some of these rights are um, almost what you might call a slam dunk right, slam dunk right, in that uh, an individual has uh, an absolute right, for example, to prevent the use of their personal data uh, for direct marketing purposes. And uh, an organization on receipt of a request in writing to stop communicating with an individual uh, should take steps to flag that record or suppress that record from their system to ensure that they're no longer uh, receiving uh, such communications. Um, other rights are uh, a core right, I should say, is the right of subject access. So individuals have a right uh, in writing to request that an organization uh, provides them with a copy of all the personal data that is held about them. In, on receiving a request in writing, an individual has uh, 40 calendar days, an organization has 40 calendar days in order to locate the records that they hold and subject to any of those records being uh, uh, exempt from the need to provide that information to the, the individual, uh, they need to provide the records that they hold. The organization needs to take steps to uh, first ensure that uh, they can verify the identity of the applicant, so they need to make sure they're not disclosing data to someone who actually is perhaps pretending to be the applicant and isn't entitled to the, rec the data, because that in itself would be a breach of the data protection law. Uh, they may charge a a fee not exceeding £10 to access the records, and they may also need uh, more information from the individual in order to help them uh, locate what they hold. Uh, where they need more information, either to verify the identity of the requester or uh, to uh, locate the records, or indeed where they have asked for a fee, uh, then the 40-day period to respond to that request does not begin until that fee has been provided or that additional information that's required has been given. Like um, I mentioned previously in relation to retention, uh, there is also uh, the seventh principle, which requires that data controllers take appropriate technical and organizational measures against unauthorized, 
or unlawful processing of personal data and against accidental loss or destruction of or damage to personal data. Now, the Act doesn't define what's meant by appropriate, uh, but guidance to this principle in the Act says that taking into account the, the state of technology and development and the cost of implementing measures, the measures taken must ensure a level of security is appropriate to the harm that might result from that processing and the nature of the data to be protected. So in other words, if we are looking at a bank that's processing financial transaction records, for example, uh, account records of its customers, uh, you might perhaps expect them to apply uh, a greater level of technology and security measures around the processing of that data than you would uh, the corner news agents, for example, with a newspaper delivery round list on its system. That said, you need to also consider the nature of the data to be protected. And if perhaps on their delivery round there happened to be a high-profile uh, individual who's, uh, was, uh, who's, who was uh, public profile required that their privacy be protected, then in fact even in that situation uh, you uh, may need to apply a higher level of protection for the data. So it's not just the technology you need to consider, it's also the nature of the data that's at issue. When thinking about technical measures, these are likely to include measures to verify delete commands, uh, to encryption tools, to automatic backup technology, uh, to firewalls or software protection that might protect against viruses or malware, or the tools that uh, keep audit trails that log system access uh, against uh, access to the system by particular people. Organizational measures will include procedures and policies, as well as ensuring the physical security of the processing systems and premises. This principle also requires data controllers to make sure the reliability of their employees, including vetting and training individuals who will have access to and will be handling the personal data. This principle is also relevant where a data controller uses uh, a service provider, a data processor, to carry out the processing of personal data on its behalf. Now, where this is the case, uh, the controller remains, the, remains legally responsible for the processing of that data on its behalf by the processor. And the controller must first take certain steps to uh, uh, ensure the processing is secure by, by the, the processor. So the controller needs to have firstly chosen the processor, having carried out proper diligence on the measures that that processor takes to process personal data securely. It needs to put a contract in place with the processor under which the processor gives guarantees that it will only process the data under the instructions of the data controller and will apply security measures that are equivalent to those that the data controller itself will have to apply under this, under this seventh principle. Finally, the controller must also take reasonable steps to ensure that the processor is complying with those measures which might include, for example, doing reviews or audits uh, or sending checklists uh, that the uh, data processor must comply with. The eighth principle creates a prohibition on exporting personal data outside the European economic area unless the destination country or territory ensures uh, an adequate level of protection for the rights and freedoms of data subjects in terms of the processing of personal data. Only a handful of countries are deemed by the, by the European Commission to have adequate protection, including but not limited to countries such as Switzerland, Argentina, New Zealand, Israel, and Canada. And there are also some more discrete findings for islands like the Faroe Islands and the Channel Islands, for example. In the case of the US, there is no federal level data protection law, so it does not have, uh, it's not deemed to provide an adequate level of protection. That said, certain measures have been agreed between the Department of Commerce and the European Commission under which transfers of personal data can be made to certain US businesses who have signed up to a set of safe harbor principles that are similar to the data protection principles we've been talking about. If the destination country outside of the EEA does not have adequate data protection laws in place, then the transfer will only be permitted in one of certain specified circumstances, such as, for example, where the subject has consented to the transfer, or the transfer is necessary for the performance of a contract with the subject, or where the rights of the data subject are protected by a contract based on EU-approved terms between the uh, exporter and the importer of the data. And there are some standard model 
uh, EC approved contractual terms that can be used in these circumstances between both controllers uh, and controllers and controllers and processors. It's also possible for multinational organizations with more complex data transfer flows to adopt binding corporate codes of conduct uh, to ensure adequacy of protection for transfers within their group of companies and have these approved by EU regulators using a process where the approvals are coordinated by one lead regulatory authority on behalf of all the other authorities. Before leaving the principles, and, and slightly out of order here, I, I, I just wanted to mention uh, reporting considerations in the event there's a security incident arising under the seventh principle that we talked about. Unless your organization is a communication service provider, uh, such as a telecommunication company or an internet service provider, there is at present no formal legal duty under the Data Protection Act for an organization to report a security breach to the information commissioner or to the affected individuals. Although uh, this is an area where the future changes to the law may introduce a breach reporting obligation under the regulation, uh, and we'll obviously be monitoring that and reporting on it going forward. That said, um, whilst there's no legal obligation, uh, unless you're, a, a, say, a telecommunications service provider at the moment, uh, there is a presumption on the part of the Information Commission that certain types of breaches will be notified to his office. A guidance published by the Information Commissioner suggests that you should assess three factors in deciding whether to report a security breach. Firstly, you need to think about the potential harm to affected individuals. So this is considered to be uh, an overriding consideration by the Information Commissioner when deciding to report. So examples of harm here might include uh, risk of identity fraud by the release of perhaps some non-public identifiers, or perhaps information about a person's private life becoming available to others. Where, however, there's little risk of harm to individuals, uh, for example, where perhaps the data is encrypted to a proper standard, then there may be no need to make a report. Secondly, think about the volume of personal data affected. A large volume of affected data should be a trigger for a presumption to report. It is, however, necessary to consider each case to decide what amounts to a large volume of data, because even low volumes of data may be a trigger if the risks associated with that low volume of data are particularly high because of the sensitivity of the data involved. And that brings us on to the third factor, the sensitivity of the personal data. So there should be a presumption to report to the Information Commissioner where the release of personal data would cause significant risk of individuals suffering substantial damage, including distress. This will be relevant for personal data that's classed as sensitive, uh, perhaps information about an individual's health or their political opinions or their sexuality. In addition to reporting the details of the breach to the Information Commissioner, it's also uh, necessary to give some thought to whether the affected individuals should also be informed. This might be necessary so that people can take steps to protect themselves, for example, by notifying their bank or, or changing their passwords. Before finishing the principles, we're just going to, um, actually, before finishing on the Data Protection Act, I should say, we're going to uh, give a high-level kind of whirlwind summary of some of the other key elements of separate data protection rules uh, where these are relevant to the electronic communications sector. And I, I'm going to start off by passing over to, to Lucy, who's going to introduce the rules relevant to marketing by email and SMS. Thank you, Sally. So you mentioned early, earlier the privacy and electronic communications regulations, um, and we're just going to run through about unsolicited marketing. So in the instance in the UK, the default position is that an individual must consent to receive unsolicited marketing messages. So if the consent is to be provided, it should be freely given, specific and informed. There is an exception to this explicit consent requirement if there are certain circumstances and conditions in place. These are that within the court that you've obtained the individual's contact details in the course of the sale or negotiations for the sale of the product or a service. This must go beyond an initial query um, to do with something unrelated to the sale of the product or the service, but it can be during the course of negotiations. It doesn't have to have gone to a sale. That you're looking to market your own similar goods or services to the individual, and at the time that you collect the individual's contact details, you offer a free of charge option to opt out of receiving communications, and in each 
communication that you subsequently send to them, there's an unsubscribe feature. Um, and there's an example of how you might capture um, those sort of things in the instance that such conditions apply. The, these rules on direct marketing don't apply to companies and corporate businesses, but do apply to sole traders and some partnerships. So if you're unsure of the status of the individual you're messaging, you should probably err on the side of caution. Even if marketing to companies and corporates, it's always important to identify yourself in the marketing communication. And as mentioned previously, even a personal name at a corporate email address must be processed in regards to the, to the General Data Protection Act. Thanks, Lucy. In terms of telephone marketing, the regulations prohibit direct marketing calls to individuals or to employees at corporates where they've previously notified the caller that they don't want to receive those calls or where they've registered with the UK statutory suppression register, the telephone preference service, or in the case of business to business numbers, it's the corporate telephone preference service. And both these registers are operated under license by the uh, UK Direct Marketing Association. However, where a person has specifically told a particular organization that they consent to receiving their calls, then the fact that that person has also registered on the telephone preference service uh, will not prevent the organization from calling them. The regulations specifically prohibit the use of automated calling systems. This is one of those systems where you pick up the receiver and you're getting a computer-generated message, perhaps from some sort of film star telling you to, to watch uh, their next movie. Um, and the whole thing is, is entirely uh, automated with no human involvement. Uh, those types of uh, call, marketing calls are, I say, uh, prohibited unless uh, you have the prior express consent of the recipient to, uh, to provide those, those communications. Finally, um, I just wanted to flag that some aspects of data privacy rules do not necessarily have personal data at their focus. In particular, the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations also include rules around the use of tracking technologies. This typically applies to um, cookies on websites, but the rule here is neutral. So it, 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 if you read it, it actually prevents any storage or access to information that's stored on the device of a user. So it, no, it may not necessarily involve a, a, a cookie technology. It could be some other form of uh, software or tool. For example, software that tracks users of, of, of apps. Um, uh, would equally be caught here. Um, and this is all regardless of whether or not there's any personal data involved. Um, uh, it, it's more to do with whether or not that technology is used to uh, place information on or access information from the user's device. At the end of 2009, amendments were made to these regulations that raised the bar on compliance to require not just that information be provided to users about these cookies or tools, but also that the consent of the user is obtained. The only clearly relevant exception to this is where uh, the cookie or cookie-like tool is strictly necessary for the provision of the services. Uh, now, this, for example, might be where a cookie is needed to operate an online shopping basket so that the user's selections can be presented at the checkout, uh, or uh, where perhaps a cookie is needed to authenticate a user's uh, uh, um, access to a secure payment section of, of a site, for example. In the UK, we typically see this requirement being met by the provision of a a clear landing page information notice or a banner that flags to the user that cookies are uh, are used on the site or within the application and um, providing them clear links to further information about how cookies are used and the ability to exercise choices. The user could then click to accept uh, to continue or the notice may make clear that by continuing to use the site or service after uh, stepping through uh, that, that notice or the banner, that, that action would be taken to imply their consent. It's worth noting here that as with the general data protection law that we talked about earlier, these specific rules implement an EC directive, and it's worth noting that different EU countries have taken different approaches to what is needed to demonstrate user consent for the, for when cookies or cookie-like tools are being, being involved. So uh, it, it's worth bearing in mind that uh, there isn't a level playing field in this area across uh, the, the entirety of Europe. So 
taking the elements that we've touched on today, it's possible to see how compliance needs to fit in practice within an overall framework of compliance. There needs to be an operating model whereby an organization understands what it is processing uh, to enable it to identify compliance risks and so that it can create controls and reporting lines to enable um, it to remediate those risks or issues. These measures would then need to be supported by uh, technology and systems and be reinforced by uh, policies and procedures. And, and to be effective, those policies and procedures and controls are going to need to fit within the culture of the organization and, and lead to a situation where compliance is, is, um, is hardwired into everyday actions and becomes second nature. Now, to achieve that in practice, these measures will also need to be reinforced by training and awareness for those handling personal data and the lines of responsibility within the organization uh, as consequences of not handling data appropriately should be, should be clearly defined and drawn out. And then finally, we go full circle back to the action of reviewing compliance against that model. So this model kind of operates a little bit like a uh, a cycle or a wheel of compliance where all the elements need to be in place for the compliance wheel to keep turning. So while we uh, look to see if any of you have any questions on uh, today's topic, I just have uh, some polling questions uh, which, uh, as you say, we will uh, be very helpful if you could provide your answers and we will share these in an aggregated form. Um, with, with you once these come through. So the first question is, has your business already completed a review of its compliance with its current responsibilities under the Data Protection Act of 1998? And if you can just indicate whether that's yes or no. The second question, does your business intend to start to review its compliance with its current responsibilities under the Data Protection Act 1998? before the end of the year? Will the answer uh, please yes or no? And thirdly, does your business intend to wait until the data protection regulation is finalized before commencing a review of its current and future compliance obligations? Please remember to uh, press submit before, uh, after you've uh, selected your answers uh, so that we can compile those and share them back with you. It will probably take a, a minute or so to, um, hopefully slightly less than that, for the uh, answers to, to come through. In the meantime, just to um, looking at the questions that have come through, there is one question uh, where the question is, do the rules that relate to email apply more broadly? Um, uh, and I think I'm presuming that means email marketing. Um, when Lucy was explaining about um, the need to have consent to, to market uh, as a default requirement uh, uh, to communicate by email, uh, that also applies to uh, marketing messages that are sent by SMS. Uh, so uh, yes, it, it can apply uh, to, uh, to SMS as well as to email marketing approaches. We should be getting the responses through very shortly. Here we go. So in relation to the first question, has your business already completed a review of its compliance with its current responsibilities under the Data Protection Act 1998? 79% uh, of you said yes, and 21% have answered no. Um, secondly, has your business already completed a review of its compliance with its current responsibilities under the Data Protection Act? Here we've got a slight uh, drop, so it sounds like that a lot of you are in the process of reviewing your compliance, but slightly uh, fewer of you have actually completed that process. So 38% have completed that process, uh, and 56% um, of you uh, uh, have not. And then finally, has your business already completed a review of um, of uh, its, oh sorry, we, we're, the final question, does your business intend to wait until the data protection regulation is finalized before commencing a review? 46% uh, pretty evenly split here actually, 46% of you are 
saying that they are going to uh, wait uh, before um, wait till the regulation is finalised before they start this process. Um, and 46% uh, of you are saying no, they're going to they're going to start this process um, ahead of that time. Which is interesting because obviously the regulator is pushing quite uh, actively for uh, businesses to try and start bringing their their uh, compliance in, into uh, uh, into line uh, ahead of the finalisation of that process. Because obviously once the regulation is finalised, then the time frame uh, for um, for meeting the, uh, the new regulations requirements are going to be uh, quite tight. Um, we also have uh, another question here. Sorry, if a person is already a client or customer, do they still need to sign up to email marketing even if we communicate by, uh, by email? Yes, yeah, so um, if a person is a, a client or a customer, um, then they you have got their details for the purposes of you know, providing that, that custom or that service. But the use of their data to market them by email is a secondary use uh, of, their, of their data. And the Privacy Electronic Communications regulations will say, by default, you need their consent. But if you've obtained their, their details as a customer and at the time you got their details, you, you uh, uh, offered them the opportunity to object to the the receipt by them of email marketing, and they chose not to opt out, uh, then uh, that then you would be able to um, to communicate with them. But uh, if you didn't offer them that opportunity to be informed about your intention to to market, and they didn't opt out, or indeed if they weren't a customer, uh, then uh, you would you would need to um, rely on a default consent. It's worth noting here that this exception from the requirement for consent um, uh, for customers would not be capable of being relied upon by a charity which is perhaps seeking don donations, for example. Um, uh, they would have to rely on the default consent requirement for their, their collection and use of data for further marketing by email. Um, I think at that point we will bring things to a, a conclusion. There are a couple of questions. Oh, actually, sorry, we're, we're still I think we do have time for one more question, so I'll just do one more. But I notice there are a few more that have come through, so we will follow up separately out, outside of the, uh, the webinar uh, to any of those who we haven't been able to respond to um, uh, in this webinar today. Um, this, we've got a question here that says, you mentioned earlier that Europe is something of a patchwork. Uh, do you think that the new regulation will create consistency? That's a very good question. Um, that's the objective. Of the, the objective of the, uh, of the regulation is to uh, uh, create more consistency in that, at the moment, what we have is uh, European create, Europe creating law, by the way, a, a directive, and then each country in Europe has to take that law and, and, and create their own national law to implement it. And so if you think of the directive as a bit like a cake recipe, and every country has, has uh, interpreted it slightly differently, um, whereas the regulation is law that has direct effect. So there's no, there's no implementation at a local national level of the law and less chance of, of those sort of changes by way of interpretation. But in practice, um, the process of creating the regulation has become so uh, fraught with uh, um, uh, debate and uh, inability to reach agreement on some key uh, areas of the law that it may be that they have to create many uh, carve-outs or derogations uh, allowing national member states to uh, create supplemental rules uh, for particular areas of the regulation. So the reality is that we are not going to have one law that will be entirely consistent across Europe. There will still be differences, but hopefully there will be fewer differences. Um, so at that point, I think I, I say apologies to those who I know we haven't managed to get to all the questions uh, in this session today, but we will follow up with you separately on those questions uh, outside of this webinar. Uh, so it just leaves me to uh, thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the webinar helpful. Uh, we, we will, our next webinar, if you now feel fully prepared to deal with the current law, we are going to start uh, by revisiting the, uh, the progress of the regulation in, uh, in October. I think the date is October the 20th, but our, we, they, we, we will be sending an invite out closer to the, closer to the time.
so if you want to hear about the new law that's coming down the line, please do uh, join us on that uh, on that day, and uh, we uh, uh, we will be covering that uh, change in the law in some more detail then. Thank you very much.